In episode 4, Troy once again faces off against his true nemesis. In episode 5, Rock finally meets the Rangers in person, but in a completely different look from normal. From what I've read, in Ghost Age, Rock's counterpart there was actually the final boss of the series, working more discreetly to manipulate various different factions by taking on different disguises. What's the explanation for him looking different here? Far too complex for you to understand. Right. Subsequently, Jake notices something about him later. That alien from this morning? He was different. He didn't look like an insect. As I said before, Creepox only lasted until the seventh episode, Who's Crying Now, before he is destroyed by Troy. He spends the entire episode basically doing the same shtick as he had before. Insects superior to humans, might makes right, etc. And then destroyed. I suppose it should be expected, the first general for a lot of seasons was usually pretty pointless, but I get the feeling they wanted him to be more important than he actually was, build a larger rivalry with Troy that of course went nowhere. Speaking of villains, Villains that ended up being pointless, that brings us to our next plot episode, Robo Knight. During a field trip, Noah and Emma apparently stumble on friggin' Chernobyl, given the signs on this closed down factory that says, Hazard Radioactive. It's the old factory. It was closed down years ago because of too much pollution. Oh, yeah, I see why they'd want to close down a factory that was polluting the environment with nuclear waste. Just hang a sign up, that'll solve everything. And because even in the Power Rangers universe, the government is useless, nobody bothered to clean this place up, and toxic material is seeping into the ground, and apparently has been for years. You know, it's this kind of crap that resulted in Kite wanting to let us all die back in Wild Force. Well, all the pollution caused by this, and presumably other forces, led to the creation of mutated creatures that add Admiral Malkor wants to ally with. The toxic mutants are one of the dumbest parts of the first season. They live because of pollution. They are mutant creatures because of this stuff. Proof that the humans don't care! They turn a blind eye to the mess they've created! Okay, so obviously they hate pollution and lead a cursed existence. Maybe they want to destroy humans and take better care of things then, right? No, we're gonna finish what mankind foolishly started! What's that? The destruction of your environment! Hey, what? How kind of sense does that make? You hate pollution, so you create more of it? By the by, they're referred to as mutants, but what are they mutated from? Are they based on animals like the Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles? Actually, come to think of it, considering Power Rangers in Space established that Ninja Turtles The Next Mutation takes place in the same universe as this, does that mean the factory was creating mutagen? But whatever. So, yeah, they hate pollution and thus will create more of it. So, suicidal then, because if they hate pollution, it must make their lives worse, right? And more pollution every day means more and more power for us mighty mutants! You make no sense! They beat the Rangers up fairly easily, but before the mutants can finish them off, they're saved by this guy, who's wearing the Gose symbol. I am Robo Knight, protector of the environment. People have said the obvious inspiration for Robo Knight is, well, Robocop due to the voice, but honestly, that's as far as the similarities go. Robo Knight manages to destroy one of the mutants, utilizing power cards like the other Rangers, and becoming a Zord himself. However, Robo Knight doesn't recognize the other Rangers as allies. We want to know all about you. I'm glad to have you on our side. Welcome. <laughs> Wow, it says something when the actual robot acts less robotic than your lead character. The other rangers demand answers from Gose about Robo Knight, continually referring to him as a sixth ranger and being rather aggressive and pissed about this. I've got to admit, I quite like them demanding to know what the hell the deal is with this guy and not just assuming anything at face value, no pun intended, with Gose. It doesn't go anywhere, mind you, but I appreciate it. Gose explains that he created Robo Knight centuries ago with the soul mission of protecting the Earth's environment, but he's been dormant since then. Why was he dormant for centuries? Far too complex for you to understand. Gose then says the Earth itself awoke him. In case you're thinking this is gonna lead us into some weird mythology where the Earth itself is alive, don't bother. It's never explained either. What is explained is that being dormant for so long has damaged his memory circuits, meaning he doesn't recall Gose or the Rangers being allies of his. 
I guess there were Megaforce Rangers back then, or that he was programmed to recognize Gosei's symbol? He needs to relearn that his mission and yours are the same. Teaching him that will be tricky, but it is up to you to win him over as an ally. It's rare that a show actively admits that its characters are going to have to undergo an arc. Much like the Toxic Mutants, Robo Knight makes no sense. So was Gosei trying to guard the Earth before or after he was mentored by Zordon? They say he's been dormant for centuries. One, why was he dormant? Was he a backup plan like all the other backup plans Zordon developed? Is that idea of backup plans that Zordon had rubbing off on Gosei? Why would his goal simply be to protect the environment? Considering how many outside threats the Earth is faced with, shouldn't a general protect the Earth work better? What's more, why that goal centuries ago? Admittedly, ecological scarring has certainly been a problem for centuries with the increased amounts of mechanization and industrial development, but considering you guys are pushing a very simplistic pollution is bad message, surely you must have recognized that when the current environmental problems are causing actual living beings to emerge and or mutate from the pollution, that it's much worse in the present time than it would have been centuries ago. How the hell did he wake up? Was it an earthquake? Did his sensors detect how bad Bad things had gotten and that woke him up? Considering we've seen Gosei has the ability to project data cards to the Rangers for weapons, couldn't he and Tensu program a card and send it to Robo Knight with updated files and memories? Clearly he has access to the technology that summons the cards since he can bring them in whenever he wants. And why the hell is he referred to as a Ranger when he fits none of the usual guidelines for being one? I admit, it's okay if he really is a Ranger, just that it's odd that this is the first series to state specifically he is is one when other allies the Rangers have had before in similar design or the like don't get that same treatment. In the following episode, Troy tells the others about his Ranger dream, but in particular how Robo Knight was in it, but that he couldn't tell which side Robo Knight was fighting for. And then they show footage of him clearly fighting alongside the Rangers, so whoopsie there. Some scientists believe that dreams sometimes foretell the future. Other scientists believe that messages from the future come from robotic police officers sent back in time to warn of impending galactic invasion, or even radio transmissions sent back through time. The others also reiterate their suspicions regarding why Gosei never told them about Robo Knight to begin with. I get the feeling this was supposed to be a bigger plot point, that Gosei may not have had all their best interests in mind, or there was more to him than we were let on, but if that is is true, we never see it come to fruition. Robo Knight is honestly the only character in Megaforce who has an arc, starting off as caring only about the environment and disregarding human lives. Over the next several episodes, the Rangers warm him up to the idea of caring about people, that being concerned with life makes one stronger and doesn't just interfere with his mission. It's not exactly the most subtle of arcs, but it works, and there's something really charming about his Robocop voice and physical mannerisms. Eventually, he's openly working with the Rangers and wanting to learn more about humanity. Their Megazords can also come together, but it's been 20 years. It'd be weirder if they didn't come together at this point. In true Power Rangers fashion, we have ourselves a MacGuffin item, the Wild Sword, which of course they always say in a way that sounds like Wild Zord, which not only makes me double take, but is extra confusing for me considering what happens in the second season, but whatever. It's apparently an ancient weapon that was forged to protect the Earth, but it grew too powerful and was thus sealed away. The sword is apparently alive, its power growing to the point where it's close to escaping. That's a pretty loose backstory as it is, but it amazes me that this thing gets even that much of an explanation when so much else doesn't. Gosei dispatches them to get the sword before anyone evil can get their hands on it, but despite the fact that we established in the first episode that the team has teleportation capability, we never actually see them use it ever again. Instead, just walking and running everywhere. Once the sword is claimed, it grants the team their powered up form, Ultra Mode, which is basically a big golden shield on their chests and a big scepter slash sword thing. Kind of reminds me of the Mystic Legend armor from Mystic Force. I dig it. Ultra Mega Force! Red! Why is it that every weapon title like this sounds like it's trying to satirize Power Rangers with the overly simplistic, goofy names? The episode Dream Snatcher highlights something that I mentioned before, the bizarre form of laziness in this season. 
Obviously, some locations in Japan have very unique looks to them, so when a scene switches from Sentai footage to American footage, they decided to try to recreate that location's appearance as best as they could, spending money on something that really wasn't that important, since they could have played with the angle of the shot instead. Most of the action takes place from a single camera viewpoint, showing off the unique architecture behind them. So shoot from a different angle, or the more logical choice, shoot it from a bird's eye view so that you only see the ground and are not gonna notice. The stock shots of the cards were deemed not important enough to change, but recreating backgrounds to try to match the Sentai footage was apparently important enough for them to spend time on it. Admittedly, they then demorph and do more sequences in this area, but by that same token, why did this episode have to be adapted for Power Rangers when there are others that probably could have done the same job without needing to spend extra money on recreating backgrounds? We continue with some story elements in Gosei Ultimate. Throughout the episode, Tensu is working on some secret project for the Rangers. Somehow, since he doesn't have any arms. The episode once again reinforces the utter ridiculousness of the mutants, who have become a major threat again thanks to Vrock granting the two a MacGuffin box. The majority of the episode, like 90%, is Sentai footage, an episode pretty much of just fight scenes and the like. The Rangers end up trapped inside a giant version of the MacGuffin box, and both the mutants end up destroyed unceremoniously. Uh, wasn't that just a fulfilling storyline that truly told us about how pollution was totally bad? because it might make really confusing, contradictory monsters. Anyway, with the rangers trapped, Gosei apparently launches the freaking command center to go and rescue them! Rangers, your bravery has earned you this new power. Their bravery, huh? Would you like to know what their bravery was that evidently earned them this new power? It's so dark! Guys, I want you to know what an honor it's been to serve by your side. And even if that statement had anything to do with bravery, we've been watching the damn episode. Tensu only just now finished the thing. The Gosei Ultimate Command Ship, as it is called, is only just now available for them to be earned. What exactly would you have said to them if the ship wasn't ready yet? Rangers, you have earned this new power. But it's still in the shop. Call me back tomorrow and it'll be ready by then. And if he meant bravery in general, then that still doesn't make any sense. Aside from the fact that they have shown no signs of excess bravery so far, it's an ongoing fight against evil, not their damn report card. If you build a new weapon, give it to them! But then again, as I pointed out earlier, Gosei will hand over new weapons like he's giving out food at a buffet. And it's a problem within the show itself. At least half of the episodes of the first season either introduce a new power, weapon, zord, or megazord combination. I'd give you an exact count, but I've embraced the spirit of laziness here. The point still stands though, shoving in new stuff all the time and pretending like it's been earned. Trying to pretend that there is real character development and change occurring for everybody, exhibiting some new character trait when it's all just generic platitudes about bravery, teamwork, the heart of the cards, etc. Or, if it's not meant to be for character development, it's there because they need to sell as many new toys as possible, never letting things really get into a status quo beyond the one Power Rangers has had for 20 years. Fight monster, blow up monster, except more boring because there's nothing else to engage us besides something that's supposed to be new, but really is just the same thing as before in new packaging when it comes to these new powers. And you want to know what the worst part is? None of this matters! The majority of these new weapons will be completely forgotten come the second season, because of course they belong to a show that stops being adapted once the new season is around. And sorry to move ahead a bit, but it's not like these weapons end up destroyed or something, like when there was a season change in Mighty Morphin, they just stop using them for no reason! In The Human Factor, Vrock sets up his own base underwater separate from the insectoids, deciding that the insects have failed to deal with Earth. Possibly drawing inspiration from Robo Knight's success, he figures robots may have a better chance at it. I am your creation, master. And yet here he is creating Kerrigan from StarCraft, it seems. Actually, this is Metal Alice, his own general for the remainder of the season. 
All five episodes of it. While on a fundamental level, there's nothing actually different between the robots and the insectoids, I've gotta say, it seems like it brings a new bit of energy to things. Not only because Rock and Metal Alice have slightly more unique voices to them than the standard gravelly villain voice, but because, frankly, Rock is a lot more of an active villain anyway. Malcor is, frankly, on the same level of inactivity throughout the season as Master Xandred, only less annoying about it because he's not sitting around getting drunk. Although what's also funny about this episode is that it seems to really indicate there was a long-term plan as far back as the first episode. The conversation in class asked the question of who would survive past other living creatures, with the answers being insects, robots, and finally humanity. We'd already seen the insects in the show, and the robot bit was played up as a joke, and yet, as Metal Alice says, Robots are the future. We will be here long after you humans become extinct. I suspect that the original plan was for the insectoids to be defeated at the season finale, possibly even during the middle of the season, with robots becoming the main threat for the second season. However, that decision, for whatever reason, was changed, and the robot storyline was condensed into the last few episodes of the season. Bear in mind, though, that this is all speculation on my part. It's just how it feels like it plays out. Otherwise, Vrock just seems to decide to work behind the insects' backs for seemingly no reason. However, there is some follow-up explanation in the next episode, Rico the Robot, wherein Malkor says that the two of them have to conquer the Earth soon. We still have a little time left, right? <sighs> yes, but not that much. You and I must complete this mission before the others arrive. Malkor seals himself inside of a cocoon that will enhance his power, ordering Vrock to deal with the rangers in the meantime. Once Malkor is inside, Vrock pretty much announces that Malkor is a fool, and that his own victory will ensure that his royal family sees him as the one who should be leading. Another factor for my theory, or possibly just a sign of laziness, is the episode Staying on Track, wherein the plot is that Vrock decides that humanity will destroy themselves through their own frustrations with their technology. He decides to implement this plan by disrupting a train station, claiming that humans rely too much on their trains. Bear in mind that even though we don't know the actual location of the show, we can probably assume it's in the USA. While trains are still an industry in America, it's nowhere near as huge as they are in Japan. Once again, the choice of episode to adapt is stupefying. Subsequently, this may in fact be the worst episode of the first season, since even the Rangers recognize that other modes of transportation are more vital than trains after Metal Alice states that she'll be disrupting travel, checking airports and boats first. And what's even better? They get the trains running again without the ranger's help before we even hit the halfway point. When the Joker wants to create mass panic and hysteria, he blows up hospitals and threatens to kill lots of people unless his demands are met, and destroys the only major ways out of town and forces people to make moral choices. In Megaforce, the powerful alien and his logical robot general hope to cause mass hysteria and panic by making a train a little bit late. And despite this being Power Rangers, where the most illogical, dumbest things happen, nope, it doesn't actually make them upset. People are mildly irritated by the disruption and then move on with their lives. Even the episode wants nothing to do with this idiocy. Tell the villains abandon the disrupt people's lives by delaying trains thing halfway and just decide to plant some bombs. It's an episode where everybody hated the plot and just decided to do something else. Oh, but of course, it wouldn't be an episode of Megaforce without a new power-up. One of their bombs has gone off and destroyed a bridge. The rangers decide to never give up and immediately go to try to stop the train, just like anybody normally would. Rangers, your perseverance has earned you a new power. For the record, this is now four episodes to the end of the season, and again, we pretty much abandon these powers next season. In the next episode, The Human Condition, Malcor emerges from his cocoon and looks exactly the same as before. <sighs> just start complaining about having a headache and you'll be just like Master Xandred. Actually, I take that back, since Xandred at least ended up lasting until the end of both seasons of Samurai. But hey, maybe something interesting is happening with the Rangers. What are tears? What? I want to know why humans cry. Because we do. Here's a little game. Which of the two characters in this scene is the robot? You should ask Emma. 
She knows more about tears than me. I just... I don't even... Remember when I spent five minutes ranting about a baby carriage chase? Or ranting about callish explosions? I feel like if I tried to deconstruct that line of dialogue, I could devote an entire part of this review to it. Just a whole 20 minutes of trying to figure out what the frax from Time Force is meant by that, especially in conjunction with other episodes. Fortunately, much more amusing things happen with Robo Knight and the Rangers. Yellow Ranger, what is love? What is love? So yeah, Malcor comes to Earth to fight the Rangers. For the record, this is 18 episodes in, and it's the first time the Rangers have even heard of Malcor. They even defeat him without Robo Knight's assistance, since he's busy in his own subplot of the library reading about humans and learning to rap. And don't get me wrong, his subplot is actually really damn amusing. But the Rangers are fighting their biggest fight yet against the leader of the villains, the Big Boss. So on one hand, we have this... juxtaposed with this. I am Admiral Malkor. This planet now belongs to the Insectoids. Soon there will be nothing left of your world. Also, Malkor has been completely disintegrating buildings left and right without any sort of effort, probably killing thousands of people. What's especially funny is that this Sentai footage clearly comes from before certain developments of the show, since the Rangers never summon their Ultra Powers or the Gosei Ultimate Command Ship. Probably explains why Robo Knight is left out of the festivities. Instead, they just use all their normal Zords to send Malkor into his ship, which was piloted by Vrock to land on the city, and blow them both up. Despite the entire rest of the episodes being a really damn difficult fight, getting their asses kicked from one place to another, it's over in one shot. And yet, once again, this could have been much better handled, especially since we're so close to the end of the season. How about instead of ending Malkor here, you wait until the actual end of the season, where the Rangers have to sacrifice all their Zords and powers to finally end him, thus necessitating new powers and abilities. That would have emulated the Mighty Morphin days, at least, and how they handled changing powers. And the ultimate embarrassment of this fight, the crowning achievement of laziness... <laughs> was supposed to win! They didn't even bother to play the right music when they beat him! Look, I know people complained about the Megaforce theme being too much like Samurai, but for crying out loud! So how do we cap off defeating their primary foe? Robo Knight, Robo Knight, the very most by far was some knowledge there dropped by my little homie Todd, who turned me on to hip hop. Word. Still a better song than Overdrive's theme. This leads us into the final two episodes of the first season, the first of which is The Messenger. While the Rangers celebrate the defeat of the War Star Army, that's what the insectoids were called, Metal Alice travels to the wreckage of the ship and recovers Vrock, who is just barely alive. Later, she confronts the Rangers. I design robots. I'd like to introduce you to my latest project. My master was brilliant, but shared your greatest weakness, flesh. That is no longer a problem. His memory is clouded at the moment, probably a result of trauma and brain damage, so he's pretty much on robotic autopilot. So basically... He's more machine now than man. Believe it or not, though, this is not the focus of the episode, but rather the titular messenger, about 15 minutes in. Metal Alice and Vrock retreat after a fight with the Rangers, where Vrock ended up heavily damaged. Did he have a malfunction in his robot brain? Waiting for them is the messenger, an envoy of the Armada. He arrived to confirm that the Earth is ready to be handed over to them. He joins the fight against the Rangers. Who's this guy? Tell them. I am a small preview of what's to come. And they retreat after Vrock gets a small amount of damage. And then his memory is restored, and another fight ensues. So glad they stretched that whole Vrock without his memories thing out to a whole ten minutes. And then he withdraws again because he wants to toy with them. However, the episode does end on a good note. Messenger reporting from Earth. The Resistance has been defeated, and you are cleared for attack. The time is at hand for the total destruction of Earth. Thus we get to our season finale, Endgame. Which I suppose is an endgame to a degree, 
Except, of course, it's really not, since there are more enemies coming at all. Ah, well, at least it is a proper season finale, as opposed to Samurai's. But again, you'll notice that the last episode condensed several episodes worth of material into a single one, with fighting and retreating constantly, and a harbinger of doom, and a plot about Vrock not being whole and stuff. I really do think that they originally planned to skip Gokaiger, but the decision to bring it in forced a lot of last-minute changes that screwed up their planned storyline. In any event, what we do get is Vrock launching a large army of robots and loogies on the rangers. What this means is that we have the third episode in a row where 90% of the episode is fighting, where the majority of the dialogue is either posturing or attack names. During the fight, Vrock sends their primary attacks back at them, frying their morphers. But once again, an opportunity to end these powers for the sake of the next season is forgotten as the Morphers are repaired by the end. Anyway, the messenger comes and informs the rangers of Vrock's royal bloodline. Vrock is the prince's brother, the second in line to the throne. Prince? More fighting, more fighting, humans suck, humans rule. Padding, 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 padding. Robo Knight sacrifices all his internal energy to repair his own Morpher, then absorbs an attack by the messenger and uses the energy from that to recharge theirs, though he collapses from the power drain. Metal Alice and the messenger are destroyed, but his final words are of rock, warning him to hide. The armada will be here any minute, and the place will be crawling with new soldiers. They won't recognize you. Why the hell didn't you let them know what he looked like now after you contacted them in the last episode? Ugh. Vrock retreats and the rangers look for Robo Knight, who has disappeared. The rangers call Gose for advice, but... Rangers, morph now! What? Why? Morph, morph, morph! You heard him! And so the season ends with the Armada's arrival and attack on Earth. The invasion has begun.